Josh Denbo here. Listen, you've all heard me preach about the importance of defending a foreclosure case. And you've heard me preach against bankruptcy attorneys who push people into bankruptcy because that's what they do. I've said these things, but I haven't really shown you really what this means. And so to fix that, I've teamed up with Lee Perlman. I enjoy bankruptcy law for a couple of reasons. Mainly, I'm able to give a client some immediate satisfaction. And two, I really like being able to, to, to help my clients. Um, I'm, I'm referred a good deal of my business at this point in my career. And when clients come in to see me and they know that um, they've come to me because another client has been helped or satisfied, and they say, you know what, you took care of my friend, you took care of my family member, you made them feel comfortable, and you didn't judge them. That's a very important point. A lot of clients come in to see me and they feel as if they've done something wrong because their financial conditions in bad shape. When many times we talked about the fact that as a consequence of the economy or a change in jobs or medical circumstances, that many times it's not their fault, but that's the way clients feel. And sometimes you can't change that perception. Remember, bankruptcy is biblical. It goes back to the Bible. Everybody's supposed to get a fresh start every seven years. Um, it would be nice if Congress knew that sometimes. But the problem really is that someone needs to have a fresh start. They need to have breathing room. So when clients come into me and the case is concluded and we get our evaluation and they say, you know what, uh, you treated us with respect, you guided us through the process, you told me what to expect, in my mind, that's very satisfying. Lee is probably the best, he certainly, certainly is the best. He's probably the busiest consumer, consumer bankruptcy attorney in the state. He and I referred business back and forth a number of times. I'm in the north part of the state, he's in the south. We still work on files together all the time. That bankruptcy is a tool, it's not an end. Not every single person who walks in the door should be filing bankruptcy at that moment. Not every single person who walks in the door to my, my office should be filing for a modification. And together, we're going to do a Zoom call. Just briefly, my story before I introduce our two guests today, uh, Lee Perlman, a uh, lawyer in New Jersey who uh, focuses and specializes in bankruptcy, and Josh Denbo, who focuses on consumer law and uh, foreclosure. I met Josh in 2008. I had already filed bankruptcy, and I had moved from Chapter 13 to Chapter 7, and what that did was it eliminated the stay on the foreclosure that I had for my house. And I immediately went to sheriff sale. Now that whole situation we're gonna unpack with our two guests today, Lee Perlman of the law offices of Lee Perlman and Josh Denbo of Denbo and Denbo to unpack how people can use bankruptcy and foreclosure in various situations that they'll find themselves in coming out of the pandemic in 2021, all right? So um, on my um, screen right now, we have Josh Denbo and we have Lee Perlman. Um, I'm gonna let, um, Josh, you go first, okay? Just give us a quick overview of yourself, your practice, and um, you know what you'd like to kind of go over on this call. Keep it short so we can give Lee a chance to come in as well. Sure, I'm Josh Denbo. I own a consumer rights firm. I handle all aspects of consumer protection, except bank. <clears throat> and that's where Lee Perlman and I work together in a bunch of these cases, because a number of times bankruptcy is needed, but always consumer protection is required, whether you're, you're defending a foreclosure, uh, someone cheated you when they tried to collect the debt the wrong way, any kind of financial mishap is something I want to talk to you about, because all I do is represent people. And I'm going to pass it over to Lee because he really is the bankruptcy specialist. And I rely on him in large part to handle my clients when they need some bankruptcy protection along with their other consumer rights taken care of. Thanks, uh, Josh, for having me. I, I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm Lee Perlman. I'm a consumer bankruptcy attorney. Um, I'm uh, in my own firm with uh, two other lawyers. We're a team of about 10 since 1994. Um, have uh, filed the thousands of cases all over New Jersey, uh, helping people, you know, reorganize and get a financial fresh start. And uh, Josh and I have collaborated together successfully uh, when there are opportunities to uh, go against the mortgage company when they are violating uh, your consumer rights. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh's area of concentration, um, foreclosure defense, 
uh, consumer areas. So uh, those areas dovetail with bankruptcy. And sometimes it's very important to have uh, an additional expert um, on your team, somebody like Josh, where we can work together to get the homeowner and the client the best result. Okay, that's excellent. Um, for the listener here, we're really focusing on your problems. And we're going to do this probably in a couple of parts and eventually be able to take some of your calls ahead of time uh, or comments. And we'll have uh, Josh and Lee answer them directly for you. So I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of act today as your, um, as a host, a moderator to ask some of the questions. And they were designed to be open-ended. So I'm going to ask that, um, you know, Lee and Josh kind of riff a little bit on them and, you know, go ahead and use all their expertise to answer them. Um, Lee and I were chatting earlier and we were talking about when is it right to file bankruptcy? So I'd like to begin with that question. Uh, Lee, um, yeah. what kind of red flags do consumers see that's going to say, you know, you should start to think about filing bankruptcy or, or even better, speaking to a bankruptcy attorney? Yeah, Matt, I, I would say you're asking really some of the most important questions. Um, deciding when to file bankruptcy is really critical. Sometimes deciding when to file can be more important than deciding if you file, because I've always said for a long time that bankruptcy is about timing. So if you look at a continuum, um, somebody may be in the very early stages of, 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 you know, there's a consumer debt. Let's just take a credit card debt. They're behind 30, 60 days. Um, they may come to you because, you know, they realize they're not going to be able to make minimum monthly payments on a credit card. People may come to you at the point they've been served with a special civil part complaint, which is a complaint where you're being sued, for instance, on a, on a credit card debt, the underlying credit card contract. Then there's a judgment and then there's post judgment, what I call uh, stressors on the consumer side. There's wage garnishments, there's bank levies, and those are things that drive people to come in to see you. So the decision when to see a bankruptcy lawyer um, can be critical. Um, I always say that if you're having problems and we're going to use one example for today, we can use we can use the mortgage example. We can use the credit card example, but I started with credit cards. So respectfully, let's stay with that example. If you're in a situation where you have multiple credit cards and you're unable to meet the minimum monthly payments for one example, as one example, or if those minimum monthly payments are taking up a good part of your monthly disposable income and you're having difficulty and you're just servicing that debt, I call, I call that you're on a financial treadmill that you can't get off. You're not making any headway. So those are two things to look at. If you're just if you're just treading water with respect to monthly payments on credit cards and it's taking up a good portion of your take home pay, let's say I have clients where minimum monthly payments are representing half of the bi monthly income. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. You should not be you should not be servicing unsecured debt in the form of half of your monthly take home pay. Those, those, those ratios make absolutely no sense. So it might make sense to sit down with a bankruptcy attorney. You may be a bankruptcy candidate. You may not. Look at bankruptcy options. Look at non-bankruptcy options. But there's absolutely an opportunity to get an evaluation at that point. doesn't have to be with me. There are a lot of competent bankruptcy attorneys out there. But you want to be able to sit down with somebody and have somebody. Somebody needs to have a sense of your budget and understand you know, how much of your monthly income is being committed towards servicing that debt. If a bankruptcy attorney can't intelligently ask you that, they're going to rush you off the telephone. They're not going to explain the budgetary aspect of what you're paying. Run. It's not a good fit for you. And it's not somebody who's going to give you the time and attention that your case deserves. So that actually is a great description as to why I like to work with Lee, because Lee just just drew a distinction between his practice and a significant percentage of the other bankruptcy practice in the state of New Jersey. I've represented thousands and thousands of foreclosure defendants and many, many of those people end up in a bankruptcy filing. Whether that makes sense or not depends on which bankruptcy attorney that they saw. But working with Lee's example, before we get to the foreclosure side of the credit cards, if someone is dealing with a whole host of debt unsecured debt, credit cards or otherwise. Some bankruptcy attorneys are going to say, yeah, you need to file bankruptcy because that's all they do. 
And if every problem, if the only toolbox, the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so for those kinds of bankruptcy attorneys who do nothing but file bankruptcy petitions, it doesn't matter what you say, when you say it, you're going to be filing bankruptcy immediately after you retain that attorney. Lee's point is incredibly important, which is making an assessment from the beginning whether bankruptcy is correct. And he also mentioned non-bankruptcy options. Now, non-bankruptcy options are anathema, are poison to the bankruptcy attorney who doesn't want to do anything but file a bankruptcy petition and move on to the next one. I can't tell you the number of times that Lee has called me and said, listen, I've got a hinky kind of you know, debt collection action. The client says it's not her, her debt, or she's being charged too much money. What should we do about it? And that is a non-bankruptcy option. You can sue for Fair Debt Collection Practices Act violation. I can go through the credit report and see if they're overcharging or under credit claim. That becomes a Fair Credit Reporting Act claim, cause of action. I've seen situations in which people came to me and I didn't send the lead because the non-bankruptcy options resolved all the outstanding debt and put money in the people's, po- in the people's pocket. But what I like about working with Lee is he's not pushing the bankruptcy, he's pushing the solution. And the solution being what's right for the client. Um, on the foreclosure side, we're working on a file right now. But Stacy came in to see Lee about a, uh, a, ba- a need to file a bankruptcy petition because her house had just been sold. But the underlying fact behind it was that Stacy had paid all the payments under the trial modification plan. The bank had never actually sent her the final modification agreement and then, de- then decided she breached the agreement by not signing and returning the final modification agreement that the bank never sent to her. This is not an uncommon fact pattern. But for most bankruptcy attorneys, they would have filed the bankruptcy petition, discharged the debt, and she would have lost the house. But because Lee recognized the fact that she's not a bankruptcy candidate exactly yet, came to me and together we're representing her. We won at the trial level. We're in the appellate division. We're going to win again. And then there's going to be an affirmative claim against the bank, against the servicer, and against the bank's attorney for putting her through this. And I am just grateful to Stacy and I'm grateful to Lee that those two, that Lee and Stacy spoke together because I would not have gotten that file. She would have lost her house going to a different bankruptcy attorney. So the non-bankruptcy options and bankruptcy are crucially important. Um, The last point I wanna make is a huge percentage of people who come in to see me are folks who just have a reduction in income that ends up driving them into foreclosure or near foreclosure when to file the bankruptcy, what Lee was saying, the timing, crucially important. People come to see me, I can slow a foreclosure down even if there's no significant dispute in the bank's behavior for a year or a year and a half. The timing of that bankruptcy, the timing of when I send that client to, to Lee is crucially important because based on where you are in the foreclosure process, the bankruptcy filing can add months and months and months and months of time or it can add zero time. And it's a question of when to file that you need to speak to an expert about and you need someone like Lee and me. I think that, that, that Josh has stated it, you know, right on the money. I mean, you really need to understand how to be an issue spotter. And every year that I practice, it's a skill that I get better at. I'm still perfecting it. I'm practicing 26 years um, uh, this month. So really... Every, every consultation, every month that I'm in practice, I learn to issue spot and figure out where my strengths are and where I need to collaborate. And collaborating with somebody like Josh is really important because it's true. And I, you know, I, and I, and I say it regretfully, many bankruptcy lawyers, I don't want to say most, are not going to take the time to go through a pa- fact pattern and identify where there's an opportunity to help the client and to rush that client through a bankruptcy when they have a potential better result in terms of getting the house back and getting damages, you have to weigh what's going to be the better route for the client. Is it, is it, is it the fee to rush through to the discharge or is it an opportunity to maybe get damages and have somebody's home returned to them at some point? I mean, look at the case through the client's perspective rather than deciding whether it's just going to be an additional fee for your firm. I mean, that's real. And Josh's approach that way is much like mine. He, we really try 
to the extent possible to try and find the best solution for the client. And ultimately, it benefits the lawyer, too, because the lawyer has a tremendous opportunity and a happier client. Who's a happier client? Is the client happier when they the, 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 the results that you can get in connection with the litigation where Josh is going to take it to the appellate division or the individual is just going to end up with a discharge? So that's one point I want to make. The other point about timing, not to get you know, not to get too detail oriented, but it's very important when you're deciding in bankruptcy when to file because the automatic stay is what protects the homeowner. And Josh was referring to allowing the, you know, the borrower slash homeowner slash debtor to have a certain amount of time to stay in the home. You can add an extra layer of protection to the borrower slash homeowner if you use the stay in a strategic manner. So in a chapter seven where no one's paid back, remember, you know, you're going to file a chapter seven. I like to say a chapter seven historically has a short shelf life. File, hearing within a month, two or three months discharge. 80 to 90 percent of the cases go that way. If you file a chapter seven when you should have or maybe wanted to consider a 13, you're going to lose the benefit of the stay because in a chapter seven, the stay, the duration of the stay is limited. The trustee is going to abandon the bankruptcy estate, which means it's going to take it out of the bankruptcy estate. And that house is then going to be back on uh, the chopping block and it's going to be available uh, to the G. So that's that that's very significant. Whereas maybe in a chapter 13, you'll have more flexibility, the ability to keep the stay in for a longer period of time, the ability to file a plan that says you're going to get a loan modification, the ability to file a plan and bring on. Hey, hey Lee, Lee, yeah. I want to jump in for a sec because I want to push back on your seven versus 13, because this is yeah. something, by the way, ever, anyone who's watching this, this is not prepped by Lee and I. This is this is straight up first time. I want to push back on the seven for, for a moment. Let's say you have someone in a seven, yep. files a seven, and then you real and the bank comes in and says, I want to vacate the stay judge because the house is worth less than our secured position. So yep. the bankruptcy estate has nothing of value to fight over. And Correct. for everybody out there, what that means is if the house is this big and the debt is this big, the bankruptcy trustee has no interest in the house because it's less than the debt. Okay. So the plaintiff in the foreclosure case comes in and says, judge, okay, fine. The petitioner filed a bankruptcy petition with Lee Perlman, but there's nothing in the estate to allow this court to have any jurisdiction. So we want to go back to foreclosure. Let's take, for example, that fact pattern, but we have another situation like Stacy, where a seven is filed, and then you realize, wait a second, <clears throat> this client has a claim that can offset, change the default, or can offset the amount due such that there is something left in the bankruptcy estate to fight over. Tell me about an adversary proceeding in that circumstance. Yeah, so, so, so that's a great question. I, I, I would think that in that circumstance, you're, gonna, you're going to, uh, you know, let's assume we're collaborating together. What I would specifically do is I would bring you in um, um, or the trustee in a seven, the trustee is going to bring you in as special counsel and the trustee in the seven. We're not talking about a 13 yet. Yeah. It's like I tell my kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, we're, 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 we're bringing the trustee in because remember, the trustee is the one who um, makes the decision with respect to abandon the asset from the estate. That's a legal term of art. The, the house is, is an asset of the estate. Like you said, he's gonna abandon it. He's typically gonna abandon it because you owe more on the house than the house is worth. But there the trustee said, wait a second, we've now created an asset. The potential asset in the estate is that if we litigate this, there might be a pool of money for either the homeowner or some of the creditors. Trustee's gonna come in, he may file a motion OK, he may file a motion to reimpose the stay or may say, you know what? Wait a second. I'm not going to abandon the house in the bankruptcy yet. I'm not going to issue my abandonment that I do in 92 percent of all my cases. I'm going to allow Josh to come in. We're going to get him appointed a special counsel and the trustee is going to uh, allow you and he's going to he's going to collaborate with you and check in with you to see how you're doing in that litigation. That's in the context of a seven. Let, let me let me let me stay with that fact pattern because it happens yep. so many times. 
yep. where a borrower performs exactly as they're required to do under the modification. So for everybody out there watching this, a modification is obvious. Everybody knows what it is. It changes the terms of a mortgage loan to bring the loan current. So that resolves the foreclosure problem. And that's a lot of times how a foreclosure gets resolved. Not always, but a lot of times. So servicers, mortgage servicers make mistakes constantly. There was another bankruptcy attorney who shall remain nameless, who came to me after he filed an answer to foreclosure complaint, after he consented to entry on the judgment on the mortgage, he filed the, he filed the, the bankruptcy. And then he realized there was a claim, came to me. I knew it was a loser. I tried to bring it anyway, but because the attorney had conceded everything in the foreclosure, there was nothing we could do. But if Lee had come to me, if somebody else had come to me and said, look, we can fight this out in the bankruptcy court, but let's, sorry, I just wanted to draw another comparison between Lee and some of the other bankruptcy practitioners to Lee's benefit. But let's, let's work on the same fact pattern where a borrower completes the trial modification payments. As a matter of law, according to the, United, the New Jersey Superior Appellate Division and the New Jersey Supreme Court, my case, GMAC versus Willoughby, that fact pattern, borrower gets the trial mod, borrower makes all the trial mod payments, that borrower has a right to enforce the final modification agreement. When I have that fact pattern, I can bring that argument to save the house in the foreclosure proceeding. But it's also an argument that exists in the bankruptcy proceeding so long as we're dealing with a bankruptcy attorney and a foreclosure defense attorney who know how to issue spot that basic breach of contract, consumer fraud act, RESPA, FICRA claim. Those claims are worth potentially a considerable amount of money because that borrower has been harmed. Borrower's credit's been harmed. The borrower has had a breach contract. The bank has committed an act of consumer fraud. It's a big, big deal. And it's something I hammer home to every attorney I run into. But the one person I didn't need to convince was Lee. He already got it. And that's one of the reasons why I love working with this guy. Oh, Josh, I appreciate that. You, you make a really good point, though. And I want to return to what we talked about earlier. It's 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 a situation where if if most most lawyers are not really taking the time to do in the beginning a proper interview to understand what 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 is the genesis of Mr. Smith's visit to the bankruptcy lawyer. It's not, hey, he may have some unsecured debt where he needs to file, but find out, ask some questions about the modification. Was there a breach of contract? Because, hey, you're not only going to identify potential claims then you have a role, and I think you touched on it, but I want to flesh it out a little bit more. I think you need to educate through bankruptcy counsel. The trustee needs to understand that the claim may have validity. It may have value for the estate. Hey, trustee, you have to explain to them. He doesn't understand these claims. The trustee is not a consumer expert like Josh Dembo. He hasn't gone to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Hey, these are the, uh, these are the claims that we're going to enforce Here's what's going to happen. And here's the potential light at the end of the tunnel on behalf of the client. And guess what, Mr. Trustee, on behalf of the estate? Because guess what? After he administers that, he's going to either have a commission or he's going to have uh, a, you know, he's going to have a trustee commission in connection with his work. So it benefits the estate and it benefits him. But if nobody explained it to him, all he's going to do is he's going to abandon it. And then you, as the attorney on behalf of the borrower, don't have the flexibility you need to help the homeowner. Yeah, that, that's 100% true. I'm going to ask another question sort of on the same topic. So let's say two different arguments here. One is the borrower performed, therefore has a permanent modification and the loan isn't in default. If the loan's not in default, does the house remain in the bankruptcy estate or does it get booted out of the bankruptcy estate? Can you answer that for people out there watching this? Are, are, are we in the context of a seven or 13 in your example? Let's stay on the seven because I don't even understand 13. So I apologize. Yeah. So I've if, been doing if, this for 25 years. And I don't understand a 13. It, if we're in the context of a seven, I think the trustees um, analysis is, 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 you know, candidly, it's very limited. It's just an underwater, overwater, you know, underwater situation. If the house is underwater, he's going to abandon it. I'm going to go back to my earlier point. If there's a claim that's there, um, Lee, I think- Lee what, Lee, what does underwater mean? 
Well, I mean, you owe more on the house than the house is worth. Yeah, and and and, and if the trustee, if he or she, she, if he or she sees that in the capacity of the trustee, the trustee is going to simply abandon the claim. I think it's incumbent on the attorney, the bankruptcy attorney, if he identifies a potential cause of action. A, it needs to be scheduled in the petition. Your failure to list the claim in the petition could be fatal because not only could, could the claim be lost, but if there's an opportunity to get money down the road and you haven't put everyone on notice, including the bankruptcy estate, the trustee and the body of creditors, that there could be a result on behalf of the estate, you can't enforce you can't enforce the obligation. So you, you, I, wait, wait, let me I apologize and drop, but you jumped already to my second question because you know where I'm going with this, which is. If there is a if there is a breach by the bank of that modification and there yep. is no default, there is also an affirmative claim. And how would that affirmative claim work in a chapter seven? And would it be better to bring it in a chapter seven, or would it be better to bring the affirmative claim and resolve it in the foreclosure court or the United States District Court before filing the bankruptcy on a seven? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I haven't I haven't seen those kinds of claims, um, and I haven't seen many opportunities where um, the trustee is uh, collaborating, uh, working with, um, you know, an attorney such as yourself to enforce those claims. And the reason is, you know, regrettably, because people people are not um, there are not enough experts in the area like yourself to educate yeah. clients. But that that's another story. Um, yeah. But I guess my larger point is that it's uncommon. I think that you're probably better off in a 13 because I'm just trying to simplify. You're better off in a 13 because the opportunities to do something in a chapter seven are really so limited. You know, you're, 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 you have a six month shelf life from start to finish. In a 13, you have an opportunity to bring various types of motions. And, and guess what? Here's the other point that's important that just really occurred to me, you know, in the 13, the debtors and the debtors lawyer is the individual who's in charge of filing the motion to work with special counsel. So you don't have to worry about the trustee's discretion about whether they think the claim has merit or not. Um, you file an application. I file an application to have you appointed special counsel. All that means is now you're appointed by the bankruptcy court as a special litigator for purposes of enforcing whether the um, whether there was a breach of contract with respect to the loan modification, whatever the underlying claim is, right? Yeah. And at that point, we have more flexibility because the chapter 13 can remain open. And then it's almost like two train tracks. One train track is the 13 and the other train track is the adversary litigation where you've been appointed special counsel and you have an opportunity to do everything in the adversary that you ordinarily would do in federal district court. Take depositions, discovery, schedule a trial date. If, you know, yeah, so that's what I would say there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that under advisement because I'm really going to start thinking about reaching out to you on 13s when I run into that fact pattern later in a foreclosure proceeding. I, th I think that if I run into that fact pattern earlier in a foreclosure proceeding, I'm better off taking this on through to the district court without a bankruptcy filing, absent other reasons to file bankruptcy. But later in the foreclosure process, it sounds to me like working with you on the 13 on those claims, which are common and going to be legion in 2021, could be very interesting and a very powerful thing. On a, on a really legal wonky question, in the New Jersey, the New Jersey State Constitution, Article One, Section Nine, entitles homeowners to a state constitutional right to a jury trial on these affirmative claims. How does that work in a bankruptcy context? If it does, if you know, because this is a very unusual question. I'm sorry to pop it on you like this. No, it's it's okay. We we that's what we do. Um, I don't know that you have a right to a jury trial um, in a bankruptcy. I'd have to do some more research on that. My gut tells me that you you your your default position is a it's you know it's a bench trial with the judge. So I don't think I I think that goes back to you know uh, the type of judges they are, what kind of judges. You know when you look at 
you know, you look at the various articles and how the bankruptcy courts are set up. I think it's, I, I think it's a bench trial. Yeah. I think that's something that you and I both should consider on our mutual cases, because these, these matters, I think in most cases will resolve more favorably in front of a jury than a judge. Yeah. So the other opportunity there too, because you do have, again, flexibility in a 13, you can probably, <laughs> you can probably take your litigation in two different directions. One direction could be, you know, the, 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 the adversary proceeding in bankruptcy court, like we talked about, or what, what you know, there, there could be, um, there could be, it could make more sense to have you appointed special counsel just so that you're on the docket, allow, allow for there to be relief from the automatic stay so that you can litigate the case in federal district court. So oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So the cause, <laughs> yeah, two words. The cause of action is described, captured, and scheduled relative to the exemption, which is just the fancy word for the credit that the debtor gets. So again, you've listed and described the cause of action and the litigation of the bankruptcy. All parties aware there's a cause of action against the mortgagee. Okay. Then you would get that what I would do this is how I would handle it. You'd get relief from the automatic stay so that Josh can proceed against the lender in federal district court or state court, wherever he finds it appropriate. Yeah, definitely federal district court. No question about that. Yeah. So Matt, do you want to move to another topic? Cause Lee and I could go forever. Well, um, I'm going to say that um, if you're listening to this and you've been following along, um, you're going to understand one thing right now. Uh, we're, we've all been on a treadmill for basically a year. Mm. That is for, for your life as a consumer, as a homeowner, um, you may have had to use your credit cards to pay for food, pay for bills. Uh, you may not have had the type of income coming into your, your household. Your business may have been affected and you may be wondering what's going to happen with your mortgage and foreclosure if you're late, if you're 30, 60, 90 days late, if you're 30, 60, 90 days late on your credit cards, what's going to happen? And if you're looking at your lack of a better term balance sheet for your family, if 50% of your income right now is going toward unsecured debt and another portion of your income is going toward that mortgage, you're going to be coming up to a wall and we're all facing this wall on this treadmill. So what I'd like you to do right now is consider that the call that you wanna make um, is to Lee Perlman, and you can get to him at newjerseybankruptcy.com. And that's the law offices of Lee Perlman. There's a form there for free bankruptcy assessment. I would advise you to click, fill out that form, click on it now and have an email thread going into Lee, just to understand your options and have that conversation. If you have a home and you own a home, I would advise you to go to denbolaw.com, fill out the form and get an email thread going with Josh so that you can discuss your options with Josh. Now, having reached out to both of these attorneys, you have in your pocket all of the strength of the argument that you just heard and the discussion that you just heard, which is very, very powerful. All right, so the main thing that you should be getting out of this now is that you have flexibility, you have options, you have rights, you have the full power of the law behind you, and you're, you don't have to rush into any kind of a decision. This is something right. that you should be thinking about now. You know, it's the holiday and everything. We're doing this on Christmas Eve because these two attorneys know that this is very important. And coming out of the holidays, people are going to have a lot of hard choices to make and things to think about, and they're going to be anxious. People, we're going to be trying to make these decisions with COVID on our plates, with stimulus on our plates, with unemployment on our plates. And trying to make this decision under that kind of stress is a very, very difficult decision to make. So, you know, Josh, I just wanted to put that, that in there for everybody. We're going to probably um, edit this around a little bit. Um, I don't really have more questions. I mean, this is designed for being able to introduce the homeowner to say it's 2020 December, what kinds of things are happening um, with respect to foreclosure and with respect to bankruptcy? What are people facing in terms of debt? Um, what are they facing in terms of credit card debt? What are they facing in terms of uh, 
being foreclosed upon. I mean, that's, I'm going to just throw that out there to both of you. Yeah. Well, I'd like to ask Lee another question about how best to utilize both of our resources for someone who comes to either one of us with a credit card or other unsecured debt, or even secured by a, motor, by a, by a vehicle, just not secured by a house, in which there you have a debt collector violating somebody's rights, either for harassing, calling on the cell phone, calling an employer, calling family member, or being wrong as to the amount of the debt. My thinking on these cases is when you do have somebody with a significant amount of unsecured debt that's eating up half the income, a bankruptcy makes absolute total sense. I can't provide the solution through consumer claims that Lee can through bankruptcy. There's no question about that. But where somebody has an affirmative claim for harassment by a debt collector or credit injury or improper telephone calls into the cell phone, is it? I tend to think it's best to litigate those claims first, extract as many benefits as I possibly can for the consumer before filing bankruptcy. Because if it's a seven, I think that those claims are gonna get kind of eaten up and subsumed by the bankruptcy filing. Am I right on that or am I wrong on that? So Josh, this is, I mean, I, I really say this in, 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 you know, with, with, with all due respect, this is why I really like to work with you and love to work with you because you just ask the right questions and very few people do. So let's unpack a couple things that you said, uh, if I could. One, I, I wanna take a step back and, and, and let people know that I, I've worked very closely with Josh. You're not gonna find somebody with Josh's level of expertise who's gonna take the time to spend with a client before he even decides if you're gonna be a client. Josh, Josh's email exchanges with clients and the level of detail that he extracts and with someone his level of experience, I mean, Josh is probably, you know, five, six hundred dollars an hour and he's having exchanges with people where he's asking them and giving them free advice. I have to tell you, and I'm not exaggerating, it's unprecedented. You, you just don't see that. So by the time Josh says, hey, Lee, I want you to take a look at this, he's issue spotted what's important. Now, to dovetail into what Josh was asking, so I do answer the questions, not like I'm on 60 Minutes, right, where they don't answer anything. <laughs> I, 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 I think that um, in some cases, it's again, it's a, it's a specific analysis. If someone's coming to me and I've identified that there's a, a Fair Debt and Collection Practices Act issue, there's a harassment issue, there's a Fair Credit Reporting Act issue, what I'm immediately doing is saying, hey, if Josh can litigate this, and he tells me there's value and I'm gonna let him make that determination. I'm not gonna do that on my own. And, and But then I'm also looking at well, what else is out there? Is there one, you know, it's like that game I, you play on the with your kids on the boardwalk, you knock one down, another one pops up. If I'm concerned another one's gonna pop up 30 days from now, then maybe we're filing bankruptcy, scheduling the claim and whatever Josh is able to recover, the client benefits somewhat. If it's just that one claim and there aren't others, maybe Josh needs to go to town with that and litigate that in the best way he can. But every, it, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a, a lid for every hat, as they say. I think that's the expression, right? You need, you need to look at every case individually because some cases, right, you're litigating it and, and, and there are no other claims. Other times, there's so many others out there, it doesn't make sense. There are other instances where people are not candidates for bankruptcy and bankruptcy lawyers often forget this. There's too much equity in the house. Maybe, maybe the debtor is involved in a business where we're concerned they can't meet the test that they can go ahead and what we call account for their financial affairs. An example is a, maybe a business that can't produce a profit and loss. I don't want to be in front of a trustee if a debtor can't adequately explain his financial affairs. The case will, the case will lead to a, a, a trustee's objection from the United States trustee, and the case will get dismissed. Maybe there's a creditor there that Josh can defend, and then we revisit bankruptcy after he goes to see an accountant and gets his taxes filed. So you have to, it's, 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 you really got to peel the layers of the onion and look at the case from a couple different perspectives. If you're not, you're doing the client a disservice. So I, on that point, what you've described is, I, I think I get behind everything you said hundred percent, but I want to change the way to think about it a little bit because my perspective is always how do I screw the creditor 
how do I screw the bank? Your perspective is how do we protect the consumer? And it's not that I don't think about protecting the consumer, yeah. but my, my, my goal is to defend a house and sue the bad guy. So I like to think of this as three-dimensional chess at a checkers tournament. Yeah. The foreclosure plaintiff's attorney doesn't do anything but file foreclosure complaints, uh, files motions for summary judgment where somebody doesn't answer discovery. The number of times they've picked the jury is this. The number of times they've tried a case, even though they file, you know, 3,000 foreclosure complaints a year is this. They don't really know what they're doing. There are some fairly decent attorneys out there, but their experience and their expertise is so limited that intelligent, experienced litigators and bankruptcy attorneys working together can often run circles around these folks. And there are just, you've heard Lee describe in detail the various ways and issues that even you have to think about all these clients' cases. I love working with Lee because we bounce ideas out off each other left and right. And we find ways to benefit the consumer in ways that the foreclosure plaintiff's attorney or the debt collector or the debt collection plaintiff's attorney never imagined they were going to have to deal with. Never imagined. And it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, in a situation where um, you do have an individual creditor, um, you, you, you've identified claims you can bring against the creditor, whether they're FDCPA or foreclosure issues, um, sometimes the, 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 the bankruptcy lawyer um, needs to, dis, to, 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 to make a decision that's best for the client and let you run with it. Look, ultimately, um, at some point, the individual may need to file later on, but you know, I'm in this for the long haul. This is, this is my skill set. This is my area of expertise. Um, I'm not uh, going to go out and, uh, you know, do dinner theater. It's just, it's just not happening. This, 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 is, this is what I do and I do it well. Um, you know, I tell my wife, if there's going to be, if we're going to, if we're going to do something else, you can, you can decide what that skill set's going to be. But this is, this is what I'm doing now for, for, for the long term. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I like that. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same about what I, what, what, what I do too. And my skill set is not bankruptcy. Leah, how many times have I sent you an email and said, here's the client, here's the fact pattern. Should he file bankruptcy? Yeah, it, yeah, it's. I don't it's, make I don't make that assessment. You make that yeah. assessment. Yeah, and, and 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 you know the the earlier somebody can get to Josh so that he can tell you what what you need to do when you receive the foreclosure complaint, the better. How many times yes. have you drilled have you drilled into my head? Or regrettably, we've been in situations where you say, Lee, you know, you want me to get involved now but it's at the stage of the foreclosure judgment. And I would have liked, and I'll be a Monday morning quarterback Lee, but I would have liked to have seen your client six months ago, but they hadn't contacted me then. So, so we talked about that continuum in the beginning of the conversation when Matt introduced us. And it's right. People come to me when they're 30, 60 days or current, and then they come to me on the eve of a wage garnishment and everywhere in between. But the earlier you're taking a look at it, um, in most cases, it's better to be proactive rather than reactive. It just is. It's a better way. Uh, it's a better way to handle yourself uh, professionally and, and personally too, as we both know. It's it's yeah. you want to be, you want to be in a situation where you're making the decisions, so the decisions are not made for you. So there's another business line. There's another. Um, consumer claim that I've been developing for the last six months, Lee, and you don't know about it because I haven't told it to you, but I'm telling it to you now. And that is that the um, predatory mortgage modification, mortgage audit sellers are all committing crimes and acts of consumer fraud when a non-attorney, especially out of state, but even in state non-attorney, um, sells a mortgage audit, promises to provide services, takes a dime, they're committing at least a third degree crime. They're committing an act of consumer fraud. They're violating the Fair Trade Commission um, MARS rule, Mortgage Assistance Relief Services rule. They're violating 
the foreclosure fraud, the foreclosure rescue fraud prevention act. They're violating the license debt adjustment and credit counselors act. Those are all walk-in consumer fraud judgments. Any single client you see having anything to do with a house, if they have any hint of that in their background, we definitely need to talk because I'm going to sue the hell out of these guys. That's really good to know because many people come to me um, pretty regularly. Um, I see people on the consumer side who are involved in what we call in bankruptcy world DMPs, which are debt management plans. Most of them, as you know, and we've talked about, don't do what they promise they're going to do. Or uh, many of those programs, people think they want to avoid coming to see a bankruptcy attorney. I get it. You know, we're the last resort for many. Um, but what happens is those payments in the debt management plan, some of them get uploaded to fees. So if you have a $500 a month payment, from what I see, the first two or three payments go to fees and then they, uh, you know, then they're sued. Then they have a wage garnishment, a bank levy. Um, and at that point, we have no flexibility. Sometimes we have to file. Sometimes I can refer them to you if there's an opportunity. But um, those are real dangerous. Now, on the, on, on the foreclosure side, you know, it's the same situation. Somebody got involved with a individual who promised a loan modification. I, I can't tell you. It, it, you we're, we're equally offended there uh, when I hear about the fees that these people charge, how long they've been with them without a result. I just had a conversation with somebody yes, literally yesterday. How much did you pay uh, that? I paid them, you know, $5,000. How long have you been working them? You know, a year. Do you, do you have any paperwork they sent out? No. They haven't copied you on a single piece of paper. You have no idea what they're doing. But the $5,000 has cleared your bank account. It's, it's, it's horrific. Well, let me horrific. jump in for something. You're missing one important point. Collecting any money is a crime by that entity, whether they did the service or not. Good, good Collect to know. Collecting any amount of money is a violation of the Consumer Fraud Act. And I, as soon as I get my client's signature back, I am filing a comprehensive verified complaint order to show cause in the Chancery Division, probably in Ocean County. My client's first name is Esther. As soon as we file, I can give the last name. Sure. The, the target defendant is Financial Services for America, Neil Vanderpool, Eileen Vanderpool, and Ryan Vanderpool. And that complaint and all the supporting documentation is going to be on my website. It lays out the, the legal framework for these, these honestly, criminals, but they're certainly fraudsters. And I'm going after all of them. So you hear anything from any of these folks taking Absolutely. any money from anybody about a mortgage, about a modification, about it, an audit. I, I, we, you and I, we need to sue these people together. And I'm going to talk to you separately about these, um, uh, these credit, whatever these, 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 these credit, cons these debt consolidation companies. Yeah. I, I'm, I have plans for them too, but I don't have anything you know, on file yet. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, putting together some, uh, a process on that, because as we've talked about, it's, 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 it's definitely uh, systemic and it's only going to get worse with what's going on. Yeah. It's going to get worse. So I guess everybody can see why I like working with Lee so much. He's smart. He cares. He knows what he's doing and uh, he doesn't shove people into something they don't need. He gets them what they need and doing these cases together is, is like a treat. Why. Like, likewise. Yeah. Matt, from a consumer perspective, is there anything else you want us to hit on this first talk? Uh, no, you guys are really, you did really well. Um, Thank the, the view was 33,000 feet. I, I think some of this you have to kind of, um, you know, explain to people what an affirmative defense is. Um, but rather than, than do that, let's, let's call it, let's call it uh, one hour. We did about an hour. Okay. Let me get the video of this, send it back to the two of you. Take a look at it. Um, I, I'm not sure how I did flipping the screens back and forth. I, I had really, I had wanted to make sure that Lee had some time. Um, again, we can edit this so that I'm out of it and just put up the two lawyers talking and put the website information at the beginning and at the end. So that I, it's, it's much tighter that way. I really, it, it's up to you. You, you know this better than me, but I really thought you added a lot to this. Well, here's the issue is I wanted, really what I wanted people to see was, okay, here's the environment. It's a Zoom call. You can 
get a hold of either of these lawyers anytime you want and have a Zoom call just like this and ask these questions. And you can have your, your spouse on or uh, um, you know someone else in the family if you're not sure. Um, if you're a senior and you want to have a child, you know, your son or daughter on, on the thing with you, this is all available. But, you know, I wanted people to understand that this is very accessible. You guys are accessible and to be yeah. able to do this. Um, so I think being able to put up a Zoom call that people are used to seeing a Zoom call with Carissa and I and, and, and uh, Lee and Josh here, that they'll feel comfortable that this is kind of like how it goes. It's not something that, you know, if you have a question, then you ask it, what's an affirmative defense, that kind of thing. Um, all right, so here's the last consumer question and, I, and maybe you guys can kind of see it the way a consumer is seeing it right now. Tomorrow's Christmas. I want to enjoy the time with my family, all right? Next week, I'm going to come into New Year's, into the year, December 31st. Who's vulnerable right now and what should they be preparing to do going into January? And, and I don't mean vulnerable in a very um, narrow sense. Like if you're, if you're in foreclosure, you should do this. If you're not in foreclosure, but you have debt, you should do this. What would you say to um, people out there generally? What should they be focusing on first thing in January? The number one thing everybody should be focusing on going into 2021 is knowledge. And I don't mean doing research on the web because that's not knowledge. That's crazy talk. What I mean is most consumer attorneys, most bankruptcy attorneys are going to give you some, some solid advice with an initial call, initial email, initial reach out. What I recommend you do is pick an attorney, take some time put an email together that hits all the points that you're concerned about and what the relevant facts are and financial issues are you're concerned about, throw it in an email and just ask for a little advice and a little help. You getting a, getting a decent email back that's responsive to your points, that explains how your, what your options are, what your rights are, what the creditors cannot do, what the most important thing I think is that bit of knowledge gives you some, some control and it'll give you some peace. What I like to tell people is banks can make you make a decision, but unless you let them, banks are not going to control your life because you get to make the decisions. They can force you to make the decision, but as long as you understand what your, your rights, your responsibilities, your options are, you get to make the decision for yourself and your family. And that power is so important, so important. That's my that's my advice. Yeah, I think I think those good points. I think from the consumer side, um, you know, I tell clients, um, you know, the the they're diff I have difficult conversations with everyone every day, um, and I don't like to make it more difficult for people than it has to be. So what I'm what I'm really telling people right now is you need to have a general sense of your financial affairs. So it can be, a, so our conversation could be more meaningful and I can give you some next steps. What does that mean? Ha take 15 minutes and have a budget together. Know what you're spending money on monthly. Have a sense of what your debt looks like. There's a lot of tools out there to easily get um, a sense of that annualcreditreport.com free governmental website. So know your budget, know the amount of debt you have, understand where you're spending money. And from there, we can have an intelligent conversation. To do more than that, you're going to be in the weeds and a good bankruptcy attorney should be able to give you <clears throat> some direction, which is really what you need once you have a budget and an understanding of the amount of your debt. From that point, that's all. And then we can have a conversation about what makes sense. I, I want to go back to annualcreditreport.com for a moment www.annualcreditreport.com. Exactly that is the only website you go to to obtain your credit report. Correct. I've had a number of clients who Google annual credit report and then choose one of the things from the, from the list. The, but Lee said it, annualcreditreport.com is a government-backed website. That's the only one that's legitimately set up by the credit reporting agencies as required by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's the only one you can get your credit report once a year for free. During the pandemic through at least April, you can get it once a week, but you at least can get it once a year for free. 
The reason you want to go to exactly that site and not Google it is because if you Google it, the, the corporations and the, the grifters who are tracking this have a whole bunch of websites that look the same. You can click on it. They're going to capture your data. They're going to sell your data. They're going to do all kinds of stuff. Don't. It's only www.annualcreditreport.com. I can't stress that enough. But um, I just wanted to thank you both for taking the time out today and sharing your depth of knowledge um, with the homeowners of New Jersey. Matt, uh, Matt, thank you. And Josh, thank you so much. You got it. Okay. Merry Bye -bye. Christmas, all. You too, Carissa. Okay. All right. <laughs>